five out of 10 of the world's uh, largest companies in terms of market cap are tech companies that only really started existing after 1990. In other words, they're all younger than us. Uh, but technology is extraordinary, fintech is extraordinary. So over the past decade, Ravi, obviously you oversaw Singapore becoming a global hub for fintech. And uh, we'd love to know what are some of the key policy initiatives that drove innovators to Singapore and then investors to the region? Governor, it's a delight to be here in Rwanda. Uh, first off, I want to thank our co colleagues, the National Bank of uh, Rwanda, for the very close collaboration on this project. Uh, really heartwarming to see this come to fruition uh, and the coming together of Asia and Africa in the fintech space um, is it, going to be hugely impactful and that we've got to keep this momentum going. So to my Rwandan counterparts, uh, thank you very much for your hospitality and excellent arrangements. We're having a great time here so far. Um, now, we've heard a lot about innovation, technology, and fintech, um, and how it's transforming the landscape in finance. Um, the question then is, so what do policymakers do, in particular central banks and regulators? So eight years ago, in 2015, um, we had this conviction uh, at the MAS that finance this time was going to be quite fundamentally transformed by technology. And there's huge opportunity here. Uh, first, of course, to generate uh, value added, to generate jobs uh, and incomes, uh, but also a huge opportunity to make a positive impact in the lives of people, uh, to reduce risk, to increase efficiency, and to delight the customers uh, who have not always had a great time dealing with financial institutions in the past. So, there we embarked on that journey. Um, the, we need to be very clear what governments and policymakers can do. And one of the things that they cannot do is innovation. Um, and that's why they're in government. Otherwise, they'll be out there with you, know, you guys uh, as entrepreneurs. But governments and policymakers create conditions for innovation to flourish. And I'd say there are two main things that the MA has focused on. One is, of course, what we are supposed to be good at and what we are paid for to do, regulation. Regulation can be a powerful enabler for impactful, purposeful innovation. So we did quite a lot on that front. Uh, second was infrastructure. Again, this is a fundamental role of governments. Uh, governments built roads, they built railways, they built ports, airports. They build infrastructure, public goods, upon which the private sector then can operate. And what are the public goods in the innovation space? So that's the role of building infrastructure. So I think I'll come back to some of this later on, but I just thought I wanted to signal these two things. Sound regulation, regulation that is smart, risk appropriate, conducive to innovation, allows experimentation, but manages the risks all along. Regulation that does not front run innovation, but stays one step behind so as not to stifle innovation, but not too far behind that you lose track of what's going on and risks build up. So it's a very fine balance to strike. Infrastructure, like I said, in the industrial revolution, post-industrial revolution, when manufacturing became the mainstay of economic activity, we built roads, railways and such, uh, factories and so on. In a digital economy uh, where what moves is not people or goods, but what moves is data and insight and knowledge. What is the infrastructure? Payments rails, digital infrastructure, digital identities, data repositories, data connectivity. Those are the kinds of public goods in digital realm that we need to look at. And that's what we've focused on. So infrastructure and regulation. Moving on to Rwanda, I mean, it has been Amazing being here. I think I echo Ravi's comments. We are so impressed by the incredible transformation of your country. So incredibly uh, well done. And, you know, it also has aspirations, of course, to become the fintech hub within Africa by 2050. Uh, so tell us about some of the key policy initiatives launched in Rwanda that have facilitated your journey to becoming a, a fintech hub here. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Uh, let, let me join uh, Tijan to 
to welcome you all to this uh, uh, conference and thank our colleagues, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, for accepting to partner with us to organize this important uh, uh, forum. As uh, said, this is really in line with what we aspire to achieve uh, as Rwanda. We position ourselves as a, a center for meetings and conferences within Africa, which is part of the soft capital again uh, to January for two. So I really want to thank you, my colleague Ravi, for accepting to partner with us in this. Talking about Rwanda, it's more or less similar to what my colleague has said. It's uh, if you really want to promote fintech or innovation, infrastructure matters a lot. I think that's one key pillar that has uh, seen the achievements we have today, but also remains a founding stone for our future ambitions of becoming a fintech hub. But also starts from our long-term development uh, vision way back in 2000. One, when we are sort of really starting a development agenda for this country from a uh, terrible history we had, we agreed on a vision for the country, what we used to call Vision 2020. And ICT was embedded into the, into the vision as a, a key enabling factor for all our development uh, uh, initiatives. So we've been promoting ICT as really a pillar, as an, an enabler to different policies. And so building on that long-term vision, and from 2020, we are now uh, 2050 vision, ICT remains a pillar in our development agenda. So I remember way back in 2010, when government decided to invest in uh, fiber optic across the country. Uh, I think, uh, again, Tijan talked about our president. And I think we are, we are lucky that we have a leader that believes in technology and believes in the power of technology to transform societies. And he's been really, really I remember that time, 2010, I was a minister of finance then, and dealing with the limited budget, the president says, we need to lay a fiber optic across the country. Uh, it wasn't easy for me to understand the value at that time but with that vision of understanding that we needed to really invest in infrastructure, that was key. So that's one. We, we really have uh, five optic across the country, uh, digital ID that was referred to by my colleague. And building on this, with, uh, again, the government policy of open to innovation is also key. We are open to innovation and uh, welcoming all ideas and they set up different uh, uh, enabling factors to this. Uh, again, which I think Tejan talked about skills. Uh, part of the challenges we had in our development agenda was lack of skills because of our history. We are young, really young economy. But strategically, government attracted uh, key institutions in our country, like the Carnegie Mellon University from the US. Uh, African Leadership University, uh, African Institute of Maths and, and Science. All these are there to help us build the skills that we need to drive this, uh, uh, this agenda of becoming a fintech hub. But beyond fintech, it's really about technology-driven development agenda. Coming to, to, to us as a central bank, as, as uh, and focusing on, on uh, fintech, of course, regression matters a lot. Uh, we, we've really worked, we've, we've worked on our regression beyond just the fintech, but as the regression environment in general, we, we've been reforming our, our environment regressions uh, since 2017, uh, to put it at international level. If we are to attract investors here, we need to be acting at that level that the, what they expect to see in any country in this world should be the same here. So we've really reformed our, our regulatory framework. We've introduced uh, uh, a sandbox. And knowing that we needed to, to play a part as a central bank beyond just being a regulator, 
in 2021, we, we, we introduced a department within the central bank that is focused on financial sector development. So we were, the traditional role of the central bank is with financial stability. And at times, financial stability can, can, can uh, be competing with the uh, financial sector development. So we, we had to set up a specific department responsible for financial sector development. And it's the department that oversees this, uh, uh, this sandbox. So it's uh, really working with the innovators with a development mind, not with a regulatory mind. That has helped a lot to, to attract uh, innovators in the yes. fintech world. Yes. What we've just started doing also recently is we, again, which is also another, another drive of our innovations is we have uh, fintech or innovation hubs within the country. We have incubation centers. Now what we've done as a central bank, we are linking our regulatory sandbox to these hubs. At least we, start, we want to start engaging these fintechs from where they are developing their, their products, not waiting for them to develop the products and then come to us later. So they need to know what is expected from the beginning. Yeah. So they, they, there's a lot that has been is being done to really to, to facilitate innovation yeah. across different aspects, but more specifically Within yeah. the fintech I mean, it's, it's really you. amazing to hear from both of you. Uh, I think you're, you're both very much unified in your vision uh, to try to anticipate, of course, the kind of environment that's required for fintech to really thrive. And uh, so interesting that you've both touched on the fact that infrastructure is key. Of course, it's key, ICT infrastructure particularly. So, and how extraordinary that Rwanda was visionary enough to foresee that you needed those fiber optic cables uh, that long ago. Now, moving on, we are uh, limited on time. So it's really interesting because, you know, here I am, um, both me and Ravi are from Singapore. Um, we were born there and really amazing to see the kind of uh, similarities with Rwanda. You know, both countries that really have economically transformed essentially in one generation. And this is so, uh, you know, inspiring to see. But again, we're very small countries. Singapore, of course, just over a five million population. Uh, Rwanda, I believe, just over 13 million, about 14 million, small market sizes. So scalability really is key. And that's what, of course, uh, a lot of people with capital, a lot of investors want to see. So give us a sense of the kindest pers perspectives on the challenges faced by many homegrown entrepreneurs here as they try to scale beyond the region. And, uh, you know, what kind of initiatives have you both launched uh, to facilitate expansion beyond your borders? Ravi, let's start with you. Yeah. So I think in the digital and fintech space, um, being small uh, both has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, let me touch on the advantages first. Now, if you're uh, operating in a traditional uh, sector, uh, say manufacturing or logistics, um, and you're a small and medium enterprise, and you need to scale, and if you're in a small country, scaling means you have to go cross-border very soon, which is a reality in both Singapore and Rwanda and many, many countries in the world. And that's not easy. And that's not easy for most sectors. Now, the advantage is that in the fintech and digital space, you don't need to set up an overseas office. You don't need to make frequent trips. You don't need to set up hard infrastructure because the internet, your website, payments rails, and digital connectivity is what allows you to access overseas markets. It's what allows you to access overseas suppliers who can supply you with components. In other words, almost overnight, you have made the world your market and the world your supply source uh, through digital infrastructure. So having a digital presence in every country and in the major markets is much more important than having a physical presence necessarily. So that's a huge benefit that many fintech firms have benefited from. Uh, the ability to scale uh, to much larger markets. And the cost of that scaling is not insurmountable because things digital, the incremental investments are much smaller than you would need to set up compared to, say, hard infrastructure. Now, where are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are mostly in regulation. Um, to access overseas markets, uh, you have the digital roads, but then there are many checkpoints. There are regulations that are not harmonized. There are requirements that you need to meet and so on. 
And so in that sense, it can be a little bit more complex. Um, now, customer interface through the digital platform uh, allows you to overcome some of the inherent disadvantages, but also means that you don't have face-to-face -face or direct connection with the customer, and that presents its own set of challenges. So there are both uh, disadvantages and advantages. And I think overall, the digital platforms are on balance probably more democratizing uh, than constraining, that they allow smallness to actually reap the benefits of scale much earlier, uh, provided they can overcome some of these other uh, obstacles. So on balance, I think size is less and less of a constraint in the digital world. And that's something that entrepreneurs would want to focus on. And policymakers need to facilitate. So just to give a one quick example, um, or two quick examples that we did in, 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 in Singapore. One is the uh, API exchange, uh, where we wanted small fintechs to have access to large financial institutions and to help them solve their problems. Now, how does a large financial institution, say a bank or an insurance company, solve a digital problem? It wants to put out a digital product. It will go to the usual suspects, the Accentures, the IBMs, the big tech firms, to source for solutions. But actually out there in the fintech world, there are many thousands of solutions that could better meet their needs at far lower cost. But how do you find them? And that's where these platforms come in. With the API exchange platform, fintechs onboard it, financial institutions onboard it. We create a space for them to connect, put out problem statements. Fintech firms can put out solutions. If there's a meeting of minds, there is a digital meeting and then a sandbox that's built into it where they can test a solution. If it doesn't work, sorry, I'll go on to another person to give me the solution. That is what digital platforms do in a concrete example. Second example is Proxterra, where we want small and medium enterprises in countries in Africa and in Asia, including in Singapore, to be able to access overseas markets and also to, to get financing at very competitive terms, get insurance at very competitive terms, and to get uh, supplies at very competitive terms. And all of us who have used the internet, whether to plan a travel, to plan accommodation, or to go to a restaurant, you realize how much choice, a menu of choices, and the ability to make those choices that the internet provides. Similarly, when you have digital platforms, and the one that we, I'm talking about is Proxterra, which allows small and medium enterprises to connect to one another and to larger firms and to suppliers to meet their needs. So these are early, early efforts in building the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure that I spoke about, which can overcome the constraints of small size. Uh, Governor John, so give us a sense of what Rwanda is doing, you know, similar kind of policy initiatives to create an enabling environment for fintech to grow beyond its borders? The easiest uh, markets our fintechs or other digital farms would be looking at is across Africa. And the challenges we still have is really uh, uh, regressions that are not harmonized. So it's, it's difficult to, 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 to be facing different regulatory requirements in different jurisdictions. So that's one of the key challenges. Uh, of course, capital. If you have to scale up, you need you need capital. Uh, that's uh, maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, but that's also another a big challenge. And uh, skills skills remains a challenge. As I said, there are initiatives to deal with the issue of uh, the skills gap we have as a young economy. But of course, that also requires if you really to scale up, you need uh, a mass of uh, skilled. Uh, uh, professionals that can help you to to scale business across across different countries. So that that's that remains a challenge. So the different initiatives there. Uh, one is of course the CFTA. We hope that is going to be an opener to 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 reduce some of these challenges. And when I look at uh, within at least within the East African uh, community, uh, we are working closely between the regulators to harmonize our regulatory regimes. And at least that before we, we achieve the overall monetary union that we, uh, is the ambition of the region, we want to be sure that we have uh, a harmonized regulatory regime for all our uh, financial sector players. 
And uh, the issue of skills, of course, as I said, the initiatives to deal with that. But also as a country, we, we have an open uh, policy. We, it's easy to get and work, to get to, to work in Rwanda when you're a foreigner. So we make it easy to give uh, professionals uh, 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 work permits here. So we've been using that open policy to uh, uh, internationals uh, here uh, to cover the, the gaps in the short term that we have because we've had this for quite some time. So we're able to, to fill that gap. And then government is outside there working with the uh, private sector with the innovators to take them to the outside market. So talked of uh, uh, road shows going outside uh, different uh, uh, trade fairs. That helps to open up uh, the markets to in different countries. So there are a lot of initiatives. As you'd understand, we are really a young economy. Our innovators, the 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 the, the, the farms are still young and competing with these already established uh, international farms is not that easy, but at least there's that support from, from the government to, to... And also, government has been working with different countries to, to sign double tax agreements, to remove any double taxation. So there are different initiatives, really, that are there to support our, our farms to, to, to establish or to extend beyond our borders. And I think the Kigali International Financial Center is going to be the real game changer going forward. That's right, you heard it here first. Now, really interesting, uh, Governor, you mentioned skills because that brings me very nicely to my next question, which is something that Nelvin mentioned, something that Tijan mentioned as well, just the lack of talent, really, because you do need talent, you need the skills. Uh, in, in a report by IFC in Google, uh, it estimated that only 700,000 developers were available across Africa. Uh, and that is a real struggle to try to obviously make that a much larger number. Singapore, it's interesting you mentioned, uh, Governor, that um, Rwanda is opening up and letting in uh, a lot of foreign talent. Of course, Singapore has invested significantly in growing both local talent as well as foreign talent. So um, let's start with you, Ravi, about what kind of role uh, homegrown and foreign talent has played in attracting the kind of higher investment we need in Singapore fintechs. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on it, Shanjit, because um, actually, apart from uh, regulation and infrastructure, uh, human capital is another key enabler that investors look out for when they make location decisions. Uh, firstly, do the lights work, do the roads work, and do I have enough pe good people yeah. that I can employ? And on the last, actually, there are th two dimensions. Can I bring in the best international talents to this place? Is it a seamless entry process? Second, but I can't run a local operation entirely with global talent. Do I have a critical mass of local talent who can also work with them? Uh, and in, over time, you know, uh, take over the operation. So those are the considerations. And we've known that for 50 years in the pursuit of foreign direct investments into Singapore. Uh, and have worked assiduously uh, to ensure those conditions are in place, uh, both local talent and openness to global talent. And we did the same playbook for fintech and technology. Um, and so uh, we have a very open policy towards bringing in uh, high quality uh, global talent uh, in the technology space, given the shortages that are actually global <laughs> to begin with. Um, and also active programs to build up local talent uh, we engage the universities and polytechnics actively. Uh, we share with them, we bring the industry together with institutes of higher learning to share with them what the industry needs, what are the core skill sets that are required. Now, uh, universities are ancient institutions uh, which have very ancient traditions of how things should be taught and what should be taught. And there are good reasons for it. It's a training of the mind ultimately. Um, but you also want to make sure that the output from the universities and polytechnics and colleges uh, have the skills that they can employ, uh, hopefully from day one of their employment. And so curriculum needs to get adjusted continuously, right? Uh, just as the demands of the marketplace change and the labor market change. So having that interface has helped a great deal. Uh, we actively promote internships and apprenticeships uh, in the tech space. Um, and we work very closely with the Institute of Banking and Finance, which 
brings together the CEOs of the major banks and insurers and asset managers, um, which I chair and the MAS supports. Uh, and we spend a lot of time precisely on this. What are the tech talents we need? What are the skill sets? And so job descriptions get broken down into skill sets that are required. How are these, are there enough training programs available? How do we get people encouraged to take up those training programs? Uh, very strong incentives in the form of financial subsidies and so on. But equally, there must be a motivation that, that acquiring these skills is going to enhance my career uh, in the tech space. And so matching skills to jobs and jobs to careers becomes very important. And we spent quite a lot of time on that. Another exercise we did, we engaged a consultant to, to study the impact of the increased use of data analytics and robotization, RPA, root, uh, robotic process automation, uh, in the financial industry. How are jobs going to be affected? And they did a thorough study of 120 job types in the financial sector, broken down into tasks and asking which are the tasks that are going to be changed, which are the tasks that are going to be displaced, which are the tasks that are going to become even more important. The question whether technology uh, affects jobs is a bit too binary, uh, whether it creates or destroys jobs. It does both. But more importantly, what it does is changes the nature of our jobs. And that's experience, lived experience of all of us. Yeah. Have we, has our job been entirely displaced? Not quite. Uh, have entirely new jobs like ours been created to some extent? But most of us would say our jobs today look very different, even if you have not changed, yeah, especially if you have not changed jobs. Uh, 10, 20, 20 years ago, the way we go about doing our jobs has a much higher technology component. And that is key to understand. And so when we look at a bank teller, uh, and there are thousands of them in all our countries, uh, with the advent of digital banking, the, what is the purpose that bank teller provides? So they have to be digitally trained to provide value-adding services and advice, financial advice, that you can't get off the internet or, or direct channels. Remisiers, people who sell, or, or life insurance agents. Uh, today you can buy these products with far better comparison of prices and, uh, and terms of conditions uh, on the internet. So even as we enable those infrastructures, we've got to make sure these people are well trained to do something that's more high, higher value added. That's what technology does. And history has shown us technology makes our jobs more productive and able to earn higher wages. I'm going to skip ahead now because I think uh, the governor did talk about some of the initiatives that Rwanda was putting in place to attract talent um, and really crucial that you mentioned Ravi obviously trying to reach out to students you know enabling uh, an environment an educational environment that will really attract students to come into fintech something that of course the inclusive fintech festival is doing here with the careers forum we're going to have a lot of students in the house going to learn what it takes. So we've already started with the, the skills. Uh, moving on to something uh, Governor said uh, about harmonization in terms of regulatory policy. I'm going to jump ahead because we are running out of time. Uh, there are lots of initiatives of collaboration here in Africa. There's the Pan-African Payments and Settlement Systems. There's the African Continental Free Trade Agreement Protocol on Digital Trade. Uh, over in uh, Singapore, in ASEAN, you have payments connectivity between Singapore, Thailand, uh, Singapore and Malaysia, as well as Singapore and India, plus uh, Project Nexus. Um, so, uh, Governor, I'm going to move to you in terms of what role do you expect these, uh, you know, collaborations, these, these, of course, agreements uh, to play in Rwanda's journey in becoming a fintech hub? And, of course, you talked about how harmonization between all the regulatory uh, policies uh, and, and governors in Africa is key. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, I think we, we just touched on the need to, for our farms to, to look external if we are to grow, because as Rwanda, as, as Singapore, we are small countries. For us, we even see a small economy. So if we are to grow, we need you to be looking at a, a, bigger, a bigger market. And uh, the CFTA is a really uh, a big advantage to us and speaks directly to our vision of growing uh, this country to a high income uh, economy by 2050. Uh, so when, when we are talking of uh, innovation within Rwanda or attracting investment into Rwanda, when we do so 
with the target of a bigger market, that makes a difference than if we are talking of our market as, as Rwanda uh, alone. So with CFTA, we are opening up the continent or any investor coming into any of the countries to a population of 1.3 billion people from 13 million people in Rwanda. We are talking over a GDP uh, of around 3.4 trillion. So we've been positioning ourselves as a country. Luckily, we are at the center of Africa geographically. So being at the center of Africa, so what do we do to be the gateway to Africa? Because from Rwanda, you can fly to any country within Africa uh, within five hours maximum. So uh, using that advantage, geographic advantage, we're we opening up our country and uh, this CFTA really speaks up to that because we, we have free visa to, to, uh, to any African entering Rwanda, uh, connectivity in terms of the ICT, uh, that's something that we've really been investing in and therefore we should be able to connect to the rest of Africa. The Kigali International Financial Center that is attracting uh, investors and mainly focusing on fintech. This fintech is going to be domiciled here in the Kigali International Financial Center, but focusing on the, the bigger market of Africa. You talked of PAPS. Uh, PAPS is a payment a system that is supposed to be connecting, again, facilitating payments across the continent. We as central bank governors, we are involved working with the... Uh, uh, with Africa in Bank that is a sponsor of PAPS. And with PAPS, it's expected to, 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 to have an open system. Uh, so innovators can connect to this payment system through APIs. And I'm looking really forward to innovators in our Kigali International Financial Center connecting through PAPS to the rest of Africa and serving the rest of Africa. So in, in short, uh, CFTA and... Uh, uh, Pops uh, 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 really initiatives that we think are going to help us uh, achieve our long-term vision of developing this economy and knowledge-based economy. And as you know, Rwanda has been really a big, big promoter of these initiatives. Uh, the CFTA uh, uh, agreement was signed here in Kigali. Just two weeks ago, we we came to an agreement between the central bank governors and, and PAPS secretariat here in Kigali. So we, we are really remaining a center and, and driver of these uh, enabling this initiative to take shape and be able to achieve value for the entire continent. Thank yeah. you. Um, but interesting, um, Governor, you mentioned this need uh, to work with fellow central bankers within the region. This is something, of course, you all do. You must all talk to your neighbours. You must talk to other central bankers to find out what's going on, the many challenges in, a, in coming up with regulation when it comes to something as, you know, rapidly growing as fintech and rapidly transformative as fintech. So, uh, Ravi, I'll, I'll ask you about your vision behind the payments connectivity launched by Singapore, um, not just within the region, but globally. Do you think this is something that's really going to take off? Connectivity is central to most things we do in the digital realm and in fintech. Uh, it's not a new idea. Uh, when the telephone was first in invented, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, initial reaction was that it has no commercial purpose, uh, no social benefit at all. Why would you need something like a telephone? Uh, now, the value of the telephone comes not from the telephone itself, but from many people having telephones. And then they can connect and talk. And then distance is no longer a barrier. Everything we do in the digital space, connectivity is key. So you start with payments, which is a bedrock uh, of all digital transactions. The ability to pay and receive money uh, is critical, right? Um, and so it's almost a hygiene factor, a foundational infrastructure that all countries need, uh, which is a very efficient, zero cost electronic payment system. Mm. So we set about doing that. Uh, many countries now have this uh, across Asia and Africa. In fact, I think it's in the developing countries that you've seen remarkable progress in domestic electronic payments rails. Uh, more so than in the advanced economies, although the UK is one of the earliest to do this faster pay system. So when we built that, um, we made sure that it was done in, in if, as efficient as possible and as seamless as possible. Um, 
so that you can send money from one person to another just using the mobile phone, three clicks uh, for small sums. Now, that in itself brought about considerable uh, convenience benefits. But actually, the real economic benefits come from cross-border payments. Because domestic payments were already quite cheap to begin with, and most countries have real-time gross settlements payment systems. Um, moving from you know, one-day delay to real-time is good, nice to have, but it's not decisive. Um, the cost savings were small. The real challenge is, and I mentioned earlier, for small and medium enterprises especially, or for migrant workers and labor uh, crossing countries who need to send money back, small and medium enterprises who need to pay for, service, pay for supplies, cross-border payments is a huge pain. The World Bank estimates that each cross-border payment takes up in fees and charges about 6.5% of the transaction value. That's a shame for a poor person sending back $100 back to his village to have $6.50 deducted by the internet interbanking payment system uh, is a real shame. And that is why the G20 has been focused on doing this, bringing down the cost at no compromise to security and safety and to make it seamless and efficient. Um, and many countries are embarked on this. So those who have domestic int, uh, retail payment systems that are real time have a great opportunity to connect to one another. And this is what uh, underpinned our vision for connecting with Thailand in the first place. Uh, similar systems took two years of work, hard work wow. to get this done. And uh, uh, Sopnindu is here and he knows some of the blood that has been spilt <laughs> <laughs> along with sweat uh, to get this done. Uh, we're also going to be concluding one very soon with Malaysia. Simply linking the faster payment systems so that people from one country can send money to another country. Small sums at three or four clicks on a mobile yeah. phone or a mobile device. And you can imagine the, the huge cost savings, efficiency gains uh, that can be brought about simply by connecting payments rails. And we will hope at one point in the future, we can also connect with countries in Europe, in Africa and elsewhere. Yeah. Think about free trade agreements. A bilateral free trade agreement between two countries takes about a year or two to negotiate, a lot of excruciating details and then you go on to another country. There are 150 countries or more in the world. Wow. You have to multilateralize, which is what the WTO used to do, um, where you have multilateral trade agreements, where everybody comes onto a common platform and agrees these are the disciplines that will govern the exchange of goods and services across our borders. We need something like that in the digital space, um, and we need global leadership for that. This is a global public good that yes. we need to work on. Yes. Uh, on the payment space, on a much more modest scale, we are working closely with the Bank for International Settlements to see how we can link up faster payment systems across countries through a multilateral platform so that I don't need to negotiate with country by country. I go onto this platform and all the countries who are connected to this, I am connected already. Yeah. And when that's ready, we hope at some point to connect to countries in Africa too. Uh, on yeah. the same basis. Yeah. Thank you. Multilateralism is key, but I was also really inspired by what you said about remittances being so transformative to the lives of people in small villages. And this is why we are here today. We're talking about an inclusive fintech forum. It's all about financial inclusion and bringing everyone in for the greater public good. And as you say, the global public good, Ravi. Now I'm gonna uh, go on quickly to the pace of regulation something we talked about and touched on earlier. Uh, the fact that uh, regulation, and you saw it in uh, Naveen's uh, introduction as well, uh, often doesn't keep up with the pace of technological progress, how quickly it transforms, particularly in fintech. So as a regulator, how are you navigating this breakneck pace of technological development, uh, supporting innovation, while also effectively regulating it, which may potentially mean you slow it down a little bit. Uh, it, oh. It's true. It's a, it's a, it can be a bit challenging balancing the two. Uh, you, you don't steep innovation, but you don't allow products to just pop into the market and start trading and can create a financial instability. That's why we talk of a, a regulatory sandbox where you, these innovators will come and test their products in a live environment. Uh, so we, we have still been really investing in our staff, in our systems, uh, to, to cope up with the changing environment in terms of innovation. In fact, today we, we, we are undergoing 
uh, a process of digital transformation at the central bank to, to create our, ourselves into an agile organization that easily moves with the changes that is happening uh, within the country, but also globally, because we, we, we have a vision of becoming a world-class central bank, and we are always looking at our uh, colleagues globally and learning from them. I am really happy that my brother here, Ravi, has opened up his doors to, to us as, a, as the National Bank of Rwanda. We've been working with the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore. We've, we've had uh, learning really experience, even this digital transformation we are undergoing. We've had uh, broad experiences from them. So it's, it's positioning ourselves in terms of, as I said earlier, uh, we've been uh, reforming our regulatory framework to put it to international standards. Uh, but it's beyond just the regulatory framework, it's about our staff, it's about the capacity of our staff, it's about our systems we're operating, it's about when you're talking of digital uh, products, we, we can't remain uh, analog as, as a regulator. So we we really investing in uh, what we call uh, subtech uh, technology that helps us to regulate and track what is happening within uh, the financial uh, industry. Uh, so yes, it is uh, a challenge, but I think it's it's also an opportunity to 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 us to to develop ourselves to to world class standards and really be an enabler, an enabler in a way that we. As I said, for example, the reform we had just uh, two years ago, uh, uh, introducing a financial uh, development department was, it's, it's not common in central banks. We are traditionally focused on financial stability. So, but we, based on what we are seeing, we thought we had to, to, to introduce a team that really focused on financial sector development. And FinTech development is part of their main mandate too. What can we do as a central bank to facilitate and encourage the fintech world that will, but on the other side again, we have a specific department for regretting what is happening in the payment industry, in the fintech industry. So yes, we, 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 we think we are coping and we continue to, to be agile, as I say, that is object. Thank okay. you. Yeah, agility is key. I'm gonna jump ahead. Uh, I've got two last questions. I've got only time for one. One of the questions was going to be focused on the fact that we are all facing a global economic slowdown. There's less capital out there. How do you attract that capital? But hopefully now in session, we'll talk about that. Let's talk about the exciting stuff, what you mentioned earlier, Ravi, AI. How is it going to transform this industry entirely? What are we going to see in terms of, you know, putting your visionary cap on? What's going to happen in the next 10 years in this industry? Okay, this will be a very short answer because uh, the frank answer must be, I don't know. And AI itself is a very broad ranging term that covers many things. And I think what has captured a lot of imagination is one particular aspect called generative mm. artificial intelligence, which is what uh, chat GPT is about. And, uh, and a lot of studies are being now done on how it affects uh, jobs, how it affects business processes uh, and changes uh, you know, a whole range of trading patterns and business relationships. So I think this is uh, going to be an exciting new area for all of us to focus our minds on, uh, get below under the hood to see what the technology does and how it is changing uh, the landscape. Um, you mentioned earlier on about uh, the global shortage of, you know, software engineers, programmers and so on. Yeah. Uh, maybe generative AI will solve that problem. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Just to give an illustration, uh, my second son is deeply interested in, uh, in computers, but he's doing economics. Uh, but he learned coding. He interned at a fintech and he's honing those and is applying that. My daughter actually took up engineering wow. and I've been telling her, surely you need to learn to code. And she said, no, nah, I don't like coding. I just like physics and uh, all that stuff, the theoretical <laughs> stuff. And she was struggling uh, with coding, which is required in an engineering course. And I was like any dad saying, I told you, you know, yeah. to take it up during your holidays. But now she's got the last word. She says she uses chat GPT to do all her coding. Fabulous. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm now hearing from uh, uh, banks and fintechs that they may have to let go of some of their coders or have to retrain their coders because a lot of the basic stuff is going to be done by generative AI. 
So it's early days yet, so I'm not making a prediction. I'm just saying it again upends our view of the world, how we thought things were working after spending all that time trying to understand uh, uh, payments, blockchains, and so on. Yeah. Uh, AI is going to shake things up again in a way that we may not be able to imagine, but we need to get a hold on it. So I look forward to our discussions on this in the next few days. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I think that will be the last word, Ravi. I will leave it with you. And I'm truly impressed by uh, the amazing uh, steps that your children have taken to really embrace this. Because as we know, technology and AI and fintech is truly enabling us all to live better lives, to be, of course, more financially uh, included. And that's the whole theme of this inclusive uh, fintech forum. So please, a round of applause for our wonderful central bankers. Thank you for spending time with us today.